Hello, my name is Dwayne Lemon. And I'm Lance Wilbur. And we would like to welcome you to TKS, A True Knowledge of Self, where we get to know ourselves from a biblical perspective. You know, a lot of people pro might be looking and wondering why this title, True Knowledge of Self. Well, if you had an opportunity to hear our testimonies, both Brother Lance and myself, we both come from a very, very deep experience in the hip hop and R&B culture. And whether it be professional or it be more on the street ground level, we both were showing how hip hop is not just something that is only encompassed within music, but it's a culture, it's a whole lifestyle. But it's built off of a concept called knowledge of self. And therefore, we decided to put this program together where we can talk about a true knowledge of self. And that's going to be our focus to a very large degree in this session today. Lance, once again, I want to welcome you back. Yes. As I know, I'm glad to be back so we can talk some more about this idea about true knowledge of self versus knowledge of self. And I remember when you were sharing in your testimony, you were talking about knowledge of self playing a very large role in the hip hop and R&B culture. Yeah. I wanted to know if you can build on that a little bit because we're going to take it, we're going to pretty much start from there and then kind of take it higher so even our viewers can understand what we mean when we talk about a true knowledge of self. Absolutely. Uh, when we talked about some of these things and we went into it in a, in a previous episode, but we, we kind of gave a background and a history of particularly uh, the 5% uh, nation, the nation of the gods and the earth, which is what I was gravitating most towards uh, before I became a Christian. And one of the, the tenets uh, or one of the primary tenets is this idea or this concept that I think translates into uh, all streams of hip-hop culture because it's one of the primary elements of hip-hop knowledge. Uh, they talk about knowledge, wisdom, and over what they call overstanding. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of semantics and wordplay, but nevertheless, uh, essentially, knowledge of self, to, to just summarize it, is the true knowledge that the original Asiatic black man is God, mm. that genetically God is in him, and so therefore he is constantly to not only become aware and know himself, you know, the physical, mental, the spiritual, but he is to live out his true potential, which is this God nature in him. Mm. And so there's, there's a kind of an idea that the entire earth was filled with uh, different races, but that these races, the, the various races were created by, you know, a mad scientist, if you will. And, and this is literally the story. I mean, at certain levels, it sounds kind of funny and, and ridiculous, mm -hmm. uh, but this is what it's taught. And that as the races degraded or as the shades got lighter, then the moral depravity uh, became increased. Hmm. And so there are a certain group of individuals on the planet that have a God nature, and then there's certain individuals on the planet that have a devil nature. However, even those that have a devil nature, that are born with a devil nature, can, be, can, can, ha can express the God nature. But those that possess the God nature from the very beginning are destined to obtain that knowledge of self and become their sole controller, if you will. So then, you know, you talked about how it is something where as more depravity increased, but it was connected to those who were lighter. I, I Correct. You, you made that point. Yes. So I'm wondering if we could speak real plain on that. Is that. When we refer to those who are lighter, are we talking about light skin, Asiatic black men, or are we talking about indeed what we understand today to be Caucasian individuals, white people, yeah, for, talking, for real straight terms? Talking about the Caucasian races. And this is what knowledge itself was, was trying to bring out to try to, uh, I guess, enlighten individuals so they can understand these things? Yeah, it, it's kind of a, a reverse perspective. Uh, for example, uh, European descendants uh, theologically bu you know, built into their Christian theology the idea that the black races were cursed, almost subhuman, because of Cush. You know, yeah. cursed be Canaan. And so that curse, because Ham, uh, the son of Noah, uh, was dark-skinned mm -hmm. uh, historically, then the dark-skinned race was cursed because of what Ham did to his father Noah. And so it's kind of reverse of that. It's the idea of the, the concept of leprosy. For example, when uh, uh, Miriam was cursed with leprosy and it turned her skin white, that ah. lighter skin is a curse and that uh, they were cursed and, and destined to go to the Caucasus Mountains. And so there were the descendants of the Caucasian races. And so, yeah, I mean, it's a twisted idea, it's a twisted theology, if you will, but it's what 
you know, it's what was taught. Hmm, interesting. So then when we look at this concept of supposedly just down to pigmentation of skin, uh, one group can come into the world with a, a natural nature, which is evil, yeah. but because of a darker pigmentation and what have you, supposedly now there's other groups who have a godlike nature. Right. Okay. So then if, if we have this godlike nature, then in essence, we are God. So this is, this is ultimately what knowledge itself is bringing out. Right. The, the, the idea, we, like we discussed, that all religions are basically classified as tricknology. The idea that uh, there were individuals that came to confuse the race, to confuse the gods, if you will, and try to get them to believe in a false religion in which the God was not in them, the God was not them, the God was some spirit, and they called them spook religions, and all of these layers of uh, religiosity were masking and hiding the true knowledge of self from the uh, you know, original man. And what supposedly was the benefit of, okay, let's say I, I buy into this, and let's say, okay, I accept the fact that I am a God, or I am God, or what have you. What supposedly is going to be the blessing or benefit that I get of having this quote-unquote overstanding? Uh, I think that, you know, would be argued. I don't think there is a, an agreed-upon end result. Uh, there, you know, you would lean more towards the idea of, of uh, because, l let me say it this way, they dismiss the concept of there being a heaven, all right? Okay. And they believe hell is earth. So uh, we're in hell right now, living in hell. So there's no idea, uh, they, they insert different branches, the Zulu nation, uh, maybe even uh, the Nuwabians uh, and some others insert the idea that we're going to rise to a new level of human existence and pros potentially go to other planets. Hmm. I mean, they literally talk about spaceships taking us to other planets and we'll become galactic humans. Interesting. Now, when we, when we read the Bible, you know, we accept the Bible as the word of God. Yeah. Now, in brief, why, why would you say, this is why I accept the Bible as the word of God? Is just in your own words, anything that would come to mind, why do you accept the Bible as the word of God? Because we know that that's one major challenge between uh, several aspects, not holistically, but several aspects of hip hop culture is that it's more anti-Christian, anti-Bible, but yet here you and I are coming from hip hop culture, but at the same time, we are Christians. We believe in the Bible. Um, what would you say to someone, let's say our viewers are, are asking, why should I believe in the Bible? You mm -hmm. know, people are going to ask things like that. Yeah. What would, how would you help them to just give a little spurt on that? And of course, we're going to build on this later on yeah. in, in much depth. Uh, basically, from my own story, how mm -hmm. I, I came to trust the Bible as true and the authority uh, as God's word is when I studied it that very first time in that barber shop, it was the first time I had systematically approached studying the Bible. And when I saw the prophecies of Daniel chapter 2 and how God was able to years, in some cases hundreds and hundreds of years in advance, determine the course of history and the major nations that would impact the people of God throughout the centuries going all the way to the very end, when I saw that through the dream of Nebuchadnezzar, to me, that, those were, that was one of the main things that uh, solidified my understanding and, and my trust in Scripture because I, I, I had studied history. Mm -hmm. And as I said, I read some of those books where it kind of outlined and highlighted some of those prophecies. And when I saw them in the Bible consistent, I said, you know, this, this, this can't be. This can't just be contrived. Something uh, ad additionally was the fact that the contradictions that I had read about the Bible from the New Age movement or from the, the uh, Islam or from the 5% uh, nation, the contradictions that were, were highlighted were not present in the Bible once I studied the Bible. Mm -hmm. So the, they would say something like, well, um, you know, like the Quran would say Jesus didn't die on the cross, that the, a miracle took place where he changed his... His, one of his disciples' face into his face, and one of his disciples actually died on the cross, and he escaped, hmm. right? So it kind of dismisses the whole atonement and the, the idea that Jesus came as the, the lamb that, that we'll talk about at some point. Uh, so some of those elements, there's many other things, but it, the, it says there's a contradiction. Well, when, upon further research and study, well, the contradiction doesn't, doesn't exist. So the Bible speaks of itself, and it's consistent throughout. And so that consistency and that historical uh, providence 
And that foresight to me was what, what did it for me. You know, one of the things that did it for me when I, when I really think about it is in addition to the points that you just made about eliminating all these so-called contradictions, mm -hmm. of course, studying prophecy, how in the world can a book that, that goes back ages tell what's going to happen thousands of years later and it happens in pinpointed accuracy? Right. Obviously, those things are profound, but I like the words of Jesus. Jesus said, by their fruit, you shall know them. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I like about the Bible, one of the things that made me a believer in the Bible as the unadulterated word of God yeah. was because of the fruit that is born when one beholds it, reads it, and dares to live it. Right. The Bible says in John 17, 17, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is true. Yeah. So the word of God is designed to have a sanctifying effect upon an individual. And what, what does that word mean? By the Sanctify way? <laughs> means to be set apart for holy use. In other words, that this, the sanctifying effect is that when I read the Bible, if I embrace the words that are in it, the holiness that is taught through that book will now be manifested in my day to day life, in my day to day dealings with mankind. Right. And, that, and that's kind of that righteousness that that w was highlighted in, in some of the in, in hip hop culture and the knowledge side uh, is kind of was inconsistent because the man would speak the oh, I'm God and I'm my soul controller. And then they would go and you beat somebody down or you smoke weed or sell crack. And that's my point. Right. That, that's exactly my point, because, you know, as I think about it, when I read the Bible at one time when I was living a life naturally fornicating, all of a sudden the Bible introduced a concept that I am to flee from fornication. Yeah. First Thessalonians four and verse three. Yeah. And it, it brought out the fact that I can have through the power of the indwelling spirit self-control that even when I see an individual that can tempt me, that I don't have to give in to temptation. Right. In hip hop culture, I'm consistently seeing that it's do what you want, when you want, how you want. If you feel it, do it. Right. And therefore it shows it, it's a demonstration of no self-control. It's about what I want, I take it, and it's divide and conquer. Yeah. So when I looked at the principles in my life growing up in hip-hop culture, I had no self-control. Mm -hmm. When I studied the Bible and I began to see Christ dwelling within me, the hope of glory, I started to have self-control, not just over uh, my passions, but my diet, my, you know, my whole entire lifestyle. Right. So my, the thing that did it for me was when I started looking at the Bible, I said, if we study this and embrace these words in our hearts, I can actually live a life that the Bible defines as holiness. Yes. And we're going to break that down because, I mean, this is where it gets sweet. Because while the Bible brings out principles of righteousness and holiness that can be born in the fruit, or the fruit can be born in a person's life, it's kind of like the song says, you ask me how I know he lives, he lives because he's in my heart. My right. life is different. I'm not the same person. Right. But if I supposedly grew up cussing and, and swearing and cheating and stealing and smoking and everything else before supposedly I came into a knowledge of self yeah. and all of a sudden I come into knowledge of self but I'm still smoking yeah. I'm still cursing yeah. I'm still losing control I still have no uh, uh, balance in my life I still have all these ABC problems that I had before the so-called knowledge of self that tells me that those teachings are powerless right and, and that's the greatest contradiction so all of the the accusations uh, flung upon Christianity that it's weak that uh, it's, it's uh, confusion, it's lies, it's falsehoods, and l Christians are a living contradiction, is the same or even greater in, in the other side, in, in the hip-hop realm, in the knowledge side, because it is a living contradiction. You're saying one thing, and then you're doing another, and you really don't have power, and that's the key. So mm -hmm. you're saying Christianity is weak and it's powerless, but you really don't have any power to control your soul controller. And of course, there's individuals with very uh, strong willpower. So there's always maybe a pillar here or there. Mm -hmm. like, you know, even uh, in, in other religions, like a Gandhi or somebody else that can exhibit, at least publicly, sh very strong self-control and discipline. Mm -hmm. And those people are highlighted as, oh, well, here's a perfect example. But that should be across the board, or at least it should be seen in, in many cases with no compromise. And you know what, I, I, you know, as you talk, these scriptures just keep dropping in my mind. I'm thinking of 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 25. Yeah. I believe that that separates the, true, the truest sense of what God wanted to accomplish in humanity versus those who just have a good control on one pillar or another. Yeah. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 25, if any man strives for the mastery, it says he must be temperate or self-controlled in all things. Oh. So it's not about, well, I have a great diet, but at the end of the day, I still have passion in me and I find myself being violent. Right. It's about that person that in every area and every dynamic of their life, 
that God has government over them so that at every stage of life, no matter what the trials or the circumstances of life, they have total control over themselves. Right, and temperance is not just talking about uh, moderation in everything. The idea of temperance, the, the biblical concept of temperance is talking about total abstinence from anything that's harmful to me or to others and then moderation in all things that are good. That are good. Right. Exactly. Man, this is getting sweet. Okay, so knowledge itself, it, it, it teaches this whole God concept. Now, we know that there's a character in the Bible that obviously wanted to go ahead and oppose God and try to exalt himself as God. Why don't right. you talk to us about that? Uh, well, I mean, it, it has to deal with, we have to start at the beginning. We talked about Revelation 12 and war beginning in heaven, and we know that the war was fought with the dragon. And it goes on to say that the dragon is the devil and Satan. Mm -hmm. And we can trace through the Bible the origins of that corruption when it translated to the earth. And we'll be discussing that, uh, I believe, shortly or in at least the next episode. Uh, so we have to start there. Mm -hmm. And so I want to go into the Bible and look at Ezekiel chapter 28. Okay. And if I look at Ezekiel chapter 28, and not dealing with the whole entire chapter, because you can spend hours and hours on this, but it's a lamentation and kind of a parable against a certain king. And then it, trans, uh, it, it transfers, transitions to discussing Lucifer. And some of the characteristics are highlighted. We don't have time to go into all of it. But at least starting with verse 14, because it kind of gives us a, a, a glimpse into what were some of the root causes of this war. And, and again, when we're talking about war, we're not necessarily talking about fist fights and sword play. Mm -hmm. We're talking about a war, a, a ideological war, a philosophical war, right? A war with the mind, because no man can fight God. That's right. Right. If God so, is all powerful, then how is man going to supposedly try to contest yeah, with that? Yeah, or an or, angel? Yeah, any created being can't fight with God physically. So this is not what we're talking about. So we're talking about an ideological warfare, but what is it? What happened? Mm -hmm. The Bible gives us a glimpse in Ezekiel 28. And we're going to look at verses 14 to where exactly? Uh, we're going to go verses 14 to verses 17. All right. So I'm going to read through them and then, and then we'll discuss it. Okay. So Ezekiel chapter 28, starting with verse 14. It says, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created, till iniquity was found in thee. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence, and thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. I will cast thee to the ground. I will lay thee before kings, that they may behold thee. So, without going through every single mm -hmm. detail and in, 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 uh, intricate uh, aspect of these verses, it shows that what I can summarize in one statement or phrase or, or, or a word, a compound word, self-exaltation. Mm -hmm. Lucifer, who was the light bearer, which was his name uh, before he fell and became Satan, the adversary and the, the, the devil, the deceiver, the adversary and the deceiver, he was the light bearer. But as he began to focus on himself, as he began to uh, kind of meditate upon his own brightness, if you will, in his own glory, mm -hmm. he began to exalt himself in his mind. And, 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 and we'll talk about that a little bit. But he began to exalt his image of himself, if you will. And self became more important than anything else. Now, you just said something that I can almost guarantee you might have shocked the majority of our viewers just now. All right. You just said that Lucifer means what? Light bearer. So Lucifer means light bearer. Yes. Now, you know, typically when you hear the name Lucifer today, everybody runs from that name. They say, oh, that's a bad name. Right. You know, what have you. But when you look at Lucifer, you just said Lucifer means light bearer. Right. It, you was, know? it was his God-given name. That's right. It was his God-given name. So when God creates... So Lucifer, you said, became somebody. Who did he become? He became the devil and Satan. So if Lucifer became the devil and Satan, then that means that God did not create the devil and Satan. Absolutely. It means that God created 
Lucifer. Lucifer. Yeah. Now, that, I can guarantee you right now mm -hmm. that there are more than likely uh, some of our viewers that are scratching their heads. Wait a minute, I thought God created Satan. Right. And here it is that you're telling us differently. So, the same way you broke down the word uh, Lucifer, light bearer, yeah. what does Satan and devil mean? Because, yeah. you know, people are probably wondering that. Right. As we uh, mentioned, Satan and the devil means adversary and uh, the accuser. Or, yeah, yeah or the slanderer. Right. right. So then... So then we have a situation where God, when it was God's will to create, mm -hmm. God said, when we get to the angelic host, I'm going to create someone who is going to bear my light. Right, to represent me. That's right, because yeah. God is light. You know, yeah. the Bible talks about that. So God is light. God created Lucifer, who was supposed to bear that wonderful light of God to everyone that he was around. Right. So that was God's intent when he made him. Yes. But then Lucifer became... A slanderer. Mm -hmm. Lucifer became an adversary or an enemy of God. Yes. And that was based on choice. Yes. So that means that when God created the angels, God did not create the angels to just simply be robots to do everything he says without question, but that they were actually angels that were created with willpower or choice. Right. This is incredible, man. Right. Because seriously, a lot of people, they don't, they don't look at it like that. When mm -hmm. they think about this, they think that angels were just a bunch of you know, kind of robots. And, and, yeah, yeah like robots. Servants, just, slaves yes, sir. Or something, yeah. yeah, but the angels actually had will. That's right. So therefore, Lucifer became Satan. It was his choice. His choice. And then, as a result of that, the down spiral took place. And the cause of this choice we're finding in Ezekiel 28 is that it says his wisdom became corrupted by reason of his brightness. Right. Self exaltation. If we want to summarize it. Very powerful. Yeah. Very powerful. Yeah. Okay, so continue to build on it now. Uh, I want to transition now to Isaiah 14 because okay. this is another location in the Bible where it gives us kind of, it puts a magnifying glass on how Lucifer became corrupted and became the adversary, the enemy of God. So I'm going to turn to uh, Isaiah chapter 14. Mm -hmm. And as we just take a look again, we can't go through every single verse in the chapter, but we can uh, make an effort to at least highlight you know, kind of the, the crux or the, the central uh, point. So I'm looking at Isaiah chapter 14 and verses 12 to 14, and okay. I'll, I'll read them. Isaiah 14, starting with verse 12. It says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Hmm. Again, this, you know, people refer to it as an eye problem. And this repetitive focus on oneself and Lucifer now in his mind, in his heart, believing that he can be God and, in fact, be better than God, that he can ascend above God. And this is kind of the, the most uh, wicked aspect or dangerous aspect of this, uh, this uh, adulterated concept of knowledge of self, the idea that we, as human beings, and we're going to talk about this, what, what, what the Bible, this true knowledge of self, mm -hmm as human beings that we can actually become God and even become above God because God doesn't exist out there. God is here, right? Yep. And some, some, some uh, even uh, KRS-One is, is commenting on a radio show saying that what if God is a bloodline and Africa Bambada commenting as well. And for those of you who don't know who, who those people are, uh, we'll, uh, you know, in later episodes, be highlighting them. But those of you who know hip hop culture know who Africa Bambada are, uh, the leader of the Zulu Nation, and know who KRS One is, who we talked about in previous testimonies. But nevertheless, these individuals are talking about God as a bloodline. Mm -hmm. So they don't believe God is anywhere else but in mm -hmm. you. And that is very dangerous because this is what Lucifer believes. That's right. That I will ascend, I will be like the Most High. And so when we consider these things, we have to make a decision, and we're all free to do that. So we're not saying that everybody has to believe what we're saying right now, but you have to make a decision, and now consider, or at least insert into your, uh, your uh, you know, uh, choices, into your, your, your possibility of choices now, what the Bible is actually saying, and not necessarily take everything that people say about the Bible, but actually take into consideration what the Bible is saying of itself. 
And this is very powerful because you're showing that the Bible does interpret itself. Yes, and therefore, and you notice that that's what we're doing. We're just, we're just looking at what the text says and we're letting the text pretty much explain itself. Right. It's telling us that Lucifer, that was the first name. That was, that was what was given him. That's his yes. name. But we know that there is also Satan and devil. Yes. Now, the Bible is written in three languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. Right. And therefore, when you look up these original languages, you look up the word Lucifer, you get Lux Light Pharaoh, Light Bearer. Yep. And then, of course, you get Satan, adversary, devil, slanderer. Right. And we find that these choices were made. And uh, this choice was made because Satan began to look at himself. He started to look at his gifts, his talents, his skills, and his abilities, and yeah. he forgot the one who gave it to him. Right, and, and sorry, but the, the other aspect is he began to look at himself and see that he was better than everybody else. And that's also another danger or hazard, is we're comparing ourselves against others and saying, oh, well, I'm bad, or maybe I'm not, but he's worse. So as long as I'm better than him, I'm okay. But that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible gives the standard that is perfect. And you know, it's funny, as you say that, as I continually listen to you, the Lord just keeps putting more thoughts in my head. And I'd like to turn to a text of scripture because no when, I, when I think about 2 Corinthians, yeah. I want you to notice this because in 2 Corinthians, I want to look at chapter 12. Mm -hmm. And you're going to notice that something is said here. In fact, I believe it's 2 Corinthians 10. Yes. And we're going to look at verse 12. And here's what it says. And it goes along the lines of this idea of comparing ourselves. And look at what the Bible says. Hmm. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 10 and verse 12, for we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. Hmm. So here it is that the Bible yeah. is, is spelling it out, but Lance, we got to a point already where we're at the close and we just got to pick back up in our next session on yeah. this because this is getting very powerful, yep. very deep. To our audience, to our viewers, we just want to uh, thank God for you joining us. Obviously, I believe you're being as blessed as we are, and we want you to continue to come back. We want you to invite your friends. We want you to be able to see the things that God is showing us from his word as we deal with the subject of knowledge of self versus a true knowledge of self. Until the next time, we want to thank you again for joining us at TKS, A True Knowledge of Self. And always remember Proverbs 2 and verse 6, that it is the Lord that gives us wisdom, and out of his mouth comes knowledge and understanding. Look forward to seeing you next time. God bless.